So this talk presents a different kind of research uh, than that you, what you've been hearing for, for the last few days. I'm a cultural anthropologist, and I study the evolution of contemporary social life and meaning. That means I work on concepts and meta-analysis and narratives, and I'm not presenting results for you today. Um, so you have to help me think through the events and ideas that I'm talking about. And you have to help me maintain the anonymity of my research subjects. So you don't know who I'm talking about, even if you do know who I'm talking about. So that's the, that's the agreement that we have. Um, and so even if you think you recognize people, there's no need to actually identify them. And no photos that I'm going to be showing are of the same place or of the same people. And they're not place photos of the things that I'm actually talking about. They're just there to give you a, a sense of the things that I'm describing. Um, so let's try and think about what these ideas mean um, and, and not really worried about what's involved for now, the people involved. So, so far at this conference, I've heard many references to calculating the value of natural resources, calculating the value and, um, of resources and species for tourism or the evaluation of species or places for their socioeconomic value. That's something that we've been mentioning a lot. This talk asks us to think about what that kind of valuation means and to pause in our rush to assume that tourism is the best avenue for sustainability in the Bahamas. And so here are some of my examples. So it's another sunny day in the Bahamas. I find myself far from the cruise ships, traffic, and congestion of the capital, Nassau and far from the white beaches and hotels that skirt the coast. I'm on a small island, on a small farm, my feet planted firmly in the dirt. I'm out on this farm because I'm studying sustainable tourism in the Bahamas. How did I get so far from the beaten path? Tourists do not think of farming when they think of the Bahamas. This is due in large part to the fact that the Bahamian Ministry of Tourism has had a long and successful history of branding its islands as a beach vacation paradise, a triumph of what everybody knows as sun, sand, and sea. Much has been written about this brand that defines the country and indeed much of the Caribbean region. Sun, sand, and sea sells. But what does it sell? An easily accessible island tourism product. As you all know, tourism is the flag flagship industry of the Bahamas the backbone of national GDP. Several scholars have pointed out that this standard Bahamian and Caribbean tourism product has been evacuated of history, obscuring the environmental impacts of mass visitation while enabling neo-colonial relations of servitude and mastery between island hosts and visiting guests. And as has been widely acknowledged locally in recent years, the famous Sun, Sand and Sea brand is weakening in the face of competing beach vacation destinations entering the global and regional market for travelers. After drops post 9-11 and during the Great Recession, visitor numbers are currently stable, but they may be slowly declining and they do not seem to be substantively growing. So back to the farm. This small acreage is owned by a Bahamian entrepreneur who made his fortune in the US years ago and who now lives back home as a gentleman farmer. He doesn't grow the staple crops of the traditional Bahamian diet, pigeon peas, thyme, plum tomato, banana, pumpkin, citrus, Instead, he grows luxury produce for wealthy islanders, expatriates, and high-end tourists seeking lunch and something a little different. When I first meet the farmer, we stand in a field of organic arugula with a view of his compost bins, microgreens, greenhouse, and farm-to-table restaurant. Over the course of our interview, he explains that his microgreens sell for $60 a pound. And I discovered for myself that a lunch of fresh juice, salad, grains, and a fish or chicken protein will set you back nearly $30. This is the future of agriculture in these islands, he told me adamantly. Growing high value crops for an upscale market and welcoming visitors directly to the farm as agricultural tourists. He was incredibly serious, looking me right in the eye while he stated, there is no other way to sustain local food production here. Another thing tourists don't think much about when they think of the Bahamas is work. Sun, sand, and sea is synonymous with the Isles of June mythology of indolent occupants of the tropics. And yet, when I start asking around about coral reef restoration as a new tourist activity in the country, all I get are requests to work, specifically requests from local NGOs and dive operations to volunteer my labor, or even to pay to labor in coral nurseries. And I do work. 
One blazing hot Sunday, I find myself on the coast of another small island, building coral nursery trees out of PVC pipe, thick fishing filament, and bright blue plastic glue. I sit on the dock of a local dive shop in Marina, assisting a representative of a local NGO with tree construction. As we work, we sweat and talk about the relationship between the NGO and the dive shop that has grown up around coral restoration and dive volunteerism. The hard corals here are critically endangered, the NGO representative said fervently. If you have any capacity to help, any at all, you should be helping. The dive shop sells coral restoration certification dive packages for about $170 a day. Dive tourists can become a coral care specialist in an afternoon of cleaning coral trees and underwater nurseries after a morning classroom session about coral biology and conservation. We have killed off a lot of our corals with coastal development, observed the representative. Now it's time for tourism to help restore the reefs. And this is a great idea, he went on, because it is value added for the industry. So tourists can now pay to use their labor to restore reefs that future dive tourists will one day pay to explore, is the idea. So I see both these examples, the farm and the reef restoration product, as signs that we are encountering an emergent phase of tourist-related travel. This is not ecotourism, or at least it is not the mainstream brand of ecotourism of the 1990s. Instead, these are reimagined sustainable tourism schemes for the Anthropocene. What does that mean? The Anthropocene is a term generated by Earth scientists to label the near ubiquitous impacts of human activities on the planet's biogeochemical systems. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that the idea implies that humans are now the primary driving force for most planetary change across all scales. The scientific relevance of the term is something geologists, geologists have been debating and grappling with for over 16 years, and I believe they're about to come to a vote as to whether the Anthropocene will replace the Holocene as the appropriate designation for the planet's geological present. But I don't care much if the term is voted in or out. What matters to me here is the work the idea, the Anthropocene idea, has already done in all of its guises, from climate change to biodiversity loss to the freshwater crisis, to raise awareness about environmental anthropogenesis as a defining component of everyone's current reality. To put it bluntly, the Anthropocene idea proposes that wild is dead, pristine is passe, untouched is unreal. So what does the Anthropocene idea have to do with tourism? If ecotourism was a mode of tourist travel and practice tied to a style of environmentalism that sought to save pristine wilderness and pristine cultures from destruction via their entry into tourist markets, then emergent forms of sustainable travel, development design, place-based tourism, labor practice, and spatial reimagination are now tied in a similar way to the Anthropocene idea. But the purpose today is not salvage. Instead, sustainable tourism sells time-sensitive adventures and experiences with new change-adapted lifestyles in locales of heightened significance. In other words, the travel industry now brands Anthropocene space and sells Anthropocene place in markets for sustainable travel. So what do I mean by Anthropocene space? The primary examples in my own research are small islands. Once valued as laboratory settings for evolutionary processes and imagined as lo exotic locales for romantic travel, I small islands are now valued as vulnerable geological formations, supporting even more vulnerable forms of human and non-human life. I believe that the earth sciences are the prime movers of this redesignation, acting across scales, the most recognizable in bodies like the IPCC. And their work has been taken up politically, institutionalized in inter international climate negotiations through the creation of small island voting blocs such as AOSIS. Small islands are now characterized by their vulnerability to climate change, including sea level rise, freshwater scarcity, the increased propensity of storm damage, ecological fragility, and lack of food security. They're imagined in policy circles as formations of socio-ecological risk. They are a geographical symbol for the Anthropocene. They are an Anthropocene space. Of course, there are other obvious examples of the reformulation of spatial knowledge and imagination at the intersection of the earth, earth and ecological sciences and transnational policy. The polar regions, large forested areas, glaciers, the oceans, and more. These formations come to signify the force of anthropogenesis, risk, and uncertainty. At the same time, they're also remade to signify resilience, adaptation, and sustainability in the face of anthropogenic change. 
I observed that small islands are still understood as labor exotic laboratory situations, but they are now laboratory situations for global chain scientists and forms of entrepreneurial Anthropocene enterprise. So how is Anthropocene space sold? The Bahamian Island Farm and coral restoration examples I opened with are but two attempts to sell Anthropocene space as a sustainable tourism venture. Once you start to look, you'll find many of these examples all over the world, utilizing many forms of scientifically defined Anthropocene space. I argue that these spatial imaginaries are becoming essential brand components for tourism. So first, potential Anthropocene entrepreneurs must tap into the global conversation about anthropogenic change and align their product with a recognizable and meaningful spatial imaginary, such as the vulnerable small island socio-ecological system. The farm owner does this by acknowledging the conditions of small island food security in an era of uncertainty. In his earnest way, the farmer stressed that the island population could only ho hold out for a few days or weeks without receiving regular shipments of imported foodstuffs. What do you think will happen if the boats stop coming, he asked. They will come here with guns and take everything we have. His farm tourism product is a precarious oasis in a dystopian world. Welcome visitors, get the microgreens while you can. The imaginaries that activate Anthropocene spatial brands must then be manifested in the restabilization of place. The dive operation does this by advertising their hard coral nursery as the only place in the Caribbean, a vulnerable small, small island region, to offer such a voluntourist experience. In this marketing strategy, the Bahamas, a vulnerable small island nation, becomes a significant example of eco-friendly conservation and tourism innovation within anthropogenically modified socio-ecological systems and the dive shop becomes the only means to access that example as a visitor. This specific Bahamian coral nursery is the destination, the place as a product, that now has a calculable value in a tourist market for meaning shaped by emergent understandings of anthropogenesis. I want members of this audience to recognize the linkages between the Anthropocene idea and tourism. This is an as yet understudied convergence that has real consequences for reshaping tourist modes of production and consumption, social relations between populations of human and non-human beings, and spatial politics. I hope that my work can assist in guiding the conversation towards productive ends. But I'm a political ecologist, and a political ecology of tourism for the Anthropocene must do what political ecology does so well, follow forms of power as they manifest across scales, assessing the changing relationship between politics and the more than human world. My current work follows the way space and place are symbolically and materially remade into enabling manifestations of global change science within the formation of small island travel destinations. I believe a political ecology of the Anthropocene must pay close attention to the nexus of science and capital that drives so many interventions in our lives. Other examples of this nexus include biotech ventures, military defense spending, geoengineering schemes, and any number of commercially viable systems modeling projects. The nexus that links science and tourism has long been studied as it pertains to nature conservation via park enclosure and earlier forms of ecotourism, but the sustainable tourism products of the Anthropocene provide an opportunity for closer scrutiny. Importantly, I don't see the tourism industry as co-opting the productions of the sciences. I believe that we need to examine the collaborative synergies that lead to redesigned space and new forms of value within Anthropocene tourism, tourist products. There are many paths to trace these emergent associations in a political eco ecologist toolkit. And here I'd like to use my example of Anthropocene space to quickly highlight the notion that the Anthropocene idea can be an accumulation strategy for the tourism industry. As I've stated in another way, the dive shop is selling a place-based product, reliant on the spatial imaginaries of the global change sciences that situate the Bahamas and the Caribbean within a framework of small island vulnerability, endangerment, and resilience. The NGO that hired the representative to collaborate with the large dive operation in the creation of the nursery is part of an international network of scientists and researchers whose mission is to discover and evaluate the anthropogenic origins of global coral degradation and to devise novel means to ameliorate that degradation. This is not in and of itself the accumulation of value, which comes in many forms at the expense of others. However, these networks can collaboratively enable accumulation strategies when they promote global narratives over local relationships and advocate for market-based solutions without any deep understanding of the social and historical context of markets in a given locale. 
political ecologists studying this form of sustainable tourism should mark how deeply personal and complex local ties to coral beings and reef-based processes are universally glossed as the degradation of critically endangered hard corals. They should notice how historically important marine spaces and places become marked as de facto dive space, where independent fishing livelihoods are replaced with consumptive tourist labor. They should explain how selling coral restoration dive packages to tourists becomes a paradoxical solution to the ecolog ecological damage caused by tourist populations and infrastructure. So in sum, what is enabled here is the accumulation of coral knowledge, marine territory, local spatial imaginaries, the meaning of work, and any prior local relationships to coral reefs. And this is just a taste of what can be accumulated. The erasures, these erasures or repurposing of these prior forms of value all participate in the generation of capital from the coral restoration dive packages for the dive operation and for the nation's tourism product. Money in the form of profit is just one materialization of these varied and integrated forms of accumulation. On the farm, the story is similar. The farmer has tapped into, a circulating, into circulating narratives stemming from international dialogues about small island vulnerability and food security in the face of global environmental change. Visitors marvel at the tilapia and verdant kale beds in his closed aquaponic system and enjoy a fresh salad of barley and microgreens. They're visiting a highly designed place that has been touted as one of, the, one of the most sustainable farms in the Bahamas. However, visitors are not informed that this farm tourism product uses migrant, utilizes migrant labor, Haitian, Jamaican, Latin American, and high value land purchased by the colonial elite long ago. Bahamians cannot lab labor on other people's farms for a living wage, and they certainly do not have access to land like this. Most farmers in the country don't own their own land at all, instead leasing it from the government, losing their leases after death. What's accumulated on the high-end farm is, of course, then land, but also less tangible histories of subsistence farming practices, gener generational relationships to specific well-loved but low-value crops, and the capacity for current farmers who are not already wealthy landowners landholders to pass down farms to descendants. The small island farm as tourism product has value in part because it symbolizes these histories and romantic notions of self-sufficiency, but a political ecologist knows that this is an enabling illusion that aligns with the prevailing brand of Anthropocene space being sold in a market for sustainable products. At this point, I shouldn't have to reassure the audience that neither the farmer, nor the dive operators, nor the scientists who conduct research in the Bahamas and internationally are intentionally creating tourism products that redesign and repurpose land, knowledge, and relationships towards accumulative ends. Political ecologists know that power and structures of accumulation rarely operate on the level of explicit personal intention. I don't doubt that these participants have the best intentions. The Anthropocene as an idea and as a brand platform for emergent sustainable tourism products is becoming a powerful, powerful enabler of the familiar process of accumulation tied to the global evolution of neoliberal capital in which tourism and science are major players. However, I hope my brief examples here of future-oriented tourism have shown that the selling of Anthropocene space generates new spatial imaginaries with real material consequences for the way people do business. And business, including tourism, as a means of living with and relating to ecologies by redesigning land and marinescapes, is always a highly recreative process. We might call these spaces and places tourism labs selling adventures in the Anthropocene. So my final thing is one example from Australia that was published just yesterday is this, coral bleaching tipped to be the next attraction on Great Barrier Reef. The, and the quote that goes with it from this brief article, the executive director of the Association of Marine Park Tourism Operators urged divers to head out to experience bleached coral, which could still recover if the water temperatures cooled. So thank you very much.